Good morning and, and welcome all of you who have managed to brave the freezing temperatures <laughs> and uh, all the other things that are going on today. Um, but today actually is the anniversary of the uh, inaugural event for the Janke Foundation 25 years ago. So um, we're delighted that you could join us. Um, I have a feeling that people will be gradually coming in in dribs and drabs just due to the traffic conditions and everything, but let's make a start because we have really planned a wonderful and very full day for you all. And um, in the, I think it's small is beautiful. We'll be amongst old friends and people who are really thinking in the same way and, and will appreciate all the content that's ahead of us today. So my name's Sarah Eager and I'm the chair of the Janke Foundation and a retired consultant old age psychiatrist. So I worked in the NHS for many years and have uh, quite an understanding of the challenges it faces at the moment, um, all healthcare systems. So I'm really looking forward to us exploring how we can be inspired, how we can survive in, in this work, how we can give of our best and look after ourselves at the same time. So just some thoughts about today. You know, we, we're aware that practitioner well-being is something that's talked about a lot now. I think a lot of places have well-being um, champions and things like that. But uh, I think when I have been talking to some healthcare people, they, they're saying they're even getting a bit tired of being told to look after themselves because it's, it's, the work is so um, relentless and intense and all the staff shortages that we're aware of and obviously all the strikes we're aware of and being in the system, uh, being a, a patient or a recipient of the system, you're very aware of, of what the staff are going through as well. So we didn't really want to emphasise all the problems. We thought there's been a lot of discussion about that. But have um, a realistic but, but positive approach. What could we learn from people who seem to have been surviving in this system? What is it that they've done that's kept their, their core values alive, that allows them to feel compassion, which allows them to also have compassion for themselves. So these were the, the thoughts we had when we were planning this day. And so we're going to have a few uh, speakers who will share their, their wonderful knowledge. Michael, Professor Michael West, Dr. Mary Prendergast and Wilf McSherry. And there'll be opportunities for interaction. We're um, having some movement, poetry, an inspiring film that someone's put together, Julia Ronda put together with her nephew, Louis, and they've interviewed lots of people who've had really wonderful um, inspirations about how you survive in healthcare. And some in-depth conversations, and we will have a meditation, small group discussions in the afternoon. And we're very, very lucky to have Sister Genty with us today. And she will be finishing off the afternoon with uh, an interview. Suja Chandra, a hospital social worker, will be interviewing her about he, how she survives in, in the amazing role that she plays. So um, as sort of co-hosts, Genty, I'd like to invite you onto the stage. She is the additional administrative head of the Brahma Kumaris and their NGO representative at the UN in Geneva. She's also director of BK Activities in Europe and the Middle East and has been a spiritual teacher for over 50 years and dedicated her life to self-transformation and service of humanity. So welcome, Genty, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and a warm welcome from the Brahma Kumaris to this beautiful home that we have. Sarah mentioned the formal status that we hold with the UN, but what that's meant is that there's been a lot of engagement in all the different areas of the sustainable development goals, and I don't think I need to list all those, but 
all the ideas and inspirations that people have for a better world are contained within those SDGs. And the interesting thing is that the UN has been inviting us to share with us the spiritual values underlying those SDGs. Because what they found around the year 2000 was that there was enough human resources, there were enough financial resources, there was a huge amount of information, there were all sorts of things available to be able to carry things forward to a better world, but there wasn't the political will, and maybe there wasn't even the human will to do that. And so they invited faith-based organizations to support them in this journey. And if you think about it, when we go into ourselves and we discover the original qualities of the inner being, of peace, of love, of truth, of dignity, these are the qualities that underpin all the things we would wish to see in a better world. So in a very short summary, that's the sort of work we're engaged in. On one level, it's spirituality and meditation, but the application of all of those in all the different aspects of human life are very much needed. And so that's what happens here, but not just here, but across the world in around 120 countries where the Brahma Kumaris serve. So thank you for taking the time to come here today. And it's wonderful to see many of my friends here together. Thank you. Just before you go, um, I also wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the inspiration that we all took from Daddy Janki, who was the founding president of the Janki Foundation and also the administrative head of the BKs before she passed away in 2020 at the age of 104. And in fact, the title for this day, the whole day, Care, Share and Inspire, came from a comment that someone made about Daddy when they asked her, you know, I think what you do, Daddy, is you care, share and inspire. And she said, yes, that's absolutely <laughs> right. And then she took that up. So, Genty, what, what do you feel J uh, Daddy's influence has been on, on us and the Janky Foundation and the work that, that we've been doing? Well, if I tell you that when Daddy came to London in 1974, um, we were in two little rooms in Kilburn, just not so far away from here. But that was the sum total of our presence outside India and a little tiny place in Hong Kong, that's it. And the way that she served and inspired people to journey on the path of spirituality led to so many different developments. And the most important was training teachers to be servers across the world. And that, I think, speaks for itself. And so for me personally, um, I'd say she was a little bit like an electrician. And what I mean by that is that when I came to her, I'd seen her with my, connected with my parents and so on since childhood. But um, growing up here in London, I wasn't really interested in Raj Yoga. <laughs> and then on an extended period of time in India, I decided I'd seek out what the Brahma Kumaris were teaching. And she was able to speak to me in a way that connected me with myself, but also connected me with the source. And so she, is, she was an absolute miracle worker, I would say. <laughs> and she also um, had a, a love of healthcare and that she had the role of a nurse in the early a community, didn't she? She wasn't. Um, I visited the house in Karachi. Um, I've been going to Pakistan for some years, over a period of about 10 years. Um, and the house in Karachi in which she lived and served um, is now a boarding a school, not a boarding school, it's a school. And um, it's still around, and it's still absolutely in the condition. They restored it to the condition it was in in the 30s. And when she was there in the 30s, one little description of um, how she managed and the love with which she did things, um, there was a very steep staircase going up to the first floor, another steep staircase going up to the next floor, and of course no lift. And she would, um, the only hot water available was on the ground floor. 
And in those days, thankfully, mercifully, mercifully, there was no plastic, but however, there were metal buckets. And she was four feet, 11, I think. And she carried this metal bucket filled with hot water up those stairs and again the next flight of stairs to be able to care for her patients. And she did this service of looking after patients for about 11, period, 11 years out of the 14 years that they were at that time in enclosed order where the focus was just simply contemplation, meditation, reflection. And so for 11 of those years she did her meditation, etc. But she also served anyone in the community who was unwell. Thank you, Jenty. Thank you for the prompt. <laughs> So we're also honouring Daddy Janky, that's her photo there. And uh, to further, to hear more about uh, the work we've done, we're going to invite uh, David Goodman, who's a uh, trustee of the Janky Foundation, and Carla Mystery, who edited our newsletter for many years, so is a wonderful person to help put together a little potted history of our, um, uh, our timeline, as we're calling it. She's a community psychiatrist and also a steering group member of the Janky Foundation. So, so good morning again. Um, so my job, just to give you a brief introduction to the origins of the foundation, and actually Sarah has already mentioned that the foundation was initially set up to, to give financial support to Global Hospital and Research Centre, which will come, I think, in a minute. There's a picture behind there. So that's a hospital in Mount Abu, Rajasthan. So that's northwest India. Um, and I observed that, that the setting up of the foundation really was from a very strong inspiration from Daddy Janki. So you've heard of a little nursing background. But I know she travelled through illness since she was a child and she... You know, she really used the power of her spiritual awareness and meditation to go through those illnesses. So she had a deep interest in health. Um, as well as the local population of Mount Abu, it serves many of the indigenous people in the more remote areas through its village outreach uh, program. It has mobile clinics that go around all the, the, the various villages. Uh, many tourists also come to Mount Abu. It's a popular hill station. Uh, and many students of the Brahma Kumaris who have their spiritual headquarters in Mount Abu. So as you probably know, Rajasthan, although very rich in culture and heritage, is economically quite a poor state. So the hospital provides essential services in an area where there's, there is an acute shortage of healthcare. Um, and since it is heavily committed to deliver healthcare to all, it does provide free or subsidised outpatient consultations and treatment for the poor. So this, yes, there it is. Just checking it's there. <laughs> so this 102-bed hospital has many departments you'd expect to see, but it's somewhat different, and I'd say probably somewhat exceptional, in that it, it offers conventional allopathic medicine alongside complementary approaches and also uh, spirituality. So there's departments of uh, homeopathy, acupressure, Ayurveda, magnet therapy, yoga therapy, etc. And uh, as overall well-being is emphasised through healing of, of uh, mind, body and spirit, many of the staff are themselves trained in spiritual skills, which does include meditation. Um, there is a department now of spirituality and well-being, and that offers courses of meditation and positive thinking. Uh, to the patients if they're interested in that. The hospital has its own meditation room, its own quiet room. And I have very pleasant memories of the times when I used to work there in the dental department. It was really very good to be able to nip out, have a quick uh, time out in the quiet room before popping, <laughs> popping back to see the patients because the dental department was a very busy department. Um, and since the, the hospital opened in 1991, I think it was, I I've observed that it's really w won the trust of the community. 
uh, and its services have now expanded. It's now opened a much needed trauma centre and eye hospital at Abu Road, which is at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, it has a nursing school and a college of ophthalmology, and both offering de degree and diploma courses. Um, and also the hospital provides postgraduate training for doctors in family medicine. So I think in conclusion I'd say, you know, the, uh, the hospital that the foundation was set up to support really is quite an ongoing success story. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, so I would like to introduce to you um, an, audio, an audio visual that's been put together over the last several weeks, which is um, trying to capture the last 25 years of Janky Foundation um, events and developments. Um, it's really a series of um, images, uh, experiences, and observations. And uh, because of GDPR, we have selected uh, views only, um, and we are trying to cover the last 25 years before digitalization. Um, I do hope that you will find this uh, audiovisual informative and um, uh, hopefully uh, of refresh memories for people who have been around for the last 10 years or 25 years. Um, and I it should hopefully bring together a story. So I do hope you enjoy this. That's, thank you. <laughs> 